Bian Vian, welcome here to Startup Grand Blimfontein tonight, and thank you so much for taking the time to um, share your experience and knowledge with, with our audience today. So I'd just like to kick off with um, who, who are you guys? Where are you from? And who are Bia and Vian? You go first. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, she wants me to break first. So, um, Moshe, thank you for your uh, for telling us a little bit about pricing. It's more interesting than I remember it. I guess that's the difference between a Stanford and a Kofsi's professor. <laughs> so, um, okay. And the other thing I'm thank other thing I'm thankful for is that you used the word bullshit. Um, it blends into where I'm from. So I grew up. I was born in Bethlehem and I grew up in Bloemfontein uh, in Palisier, so it's the wrong side of the tracks. But even in Palisier, I grew up not where the vet stayed, I grew up there <laughs> at the back by the casino. So even the kids in Palisier had some things to say about where I grew up. So <laughs> okay, why, why that's relevant, um, why that's relevant, I, I picked up some bad language uh, manners there. And what didn't help us, uh, then I went to gym for sure. And then after that, I worked as a commodity trader. And it's just, I mean, the, on the trading floor, people are just famous for the way they speak. And then I think some of you must have seen Silicon Valley. Uh, again, I mean, if you put a lot of, if you put like 10,000 people with Asperger's in 45 square miles, <laughs> I think obviously don't have the most polished social skills. So long story short, that's actually my background. And... Uh, if one or two F-bombs or something comes across, it's just, I don't mean bad, it's just um, people did it, society did it to me. <laughs> so it could be good. Cool. Um, I'm Bia. I'm actually, uh, I was born in Gebabis in Namibia. Does anyone know that place? <laughs> Very small. So Bloom was a big change for me, big city life. Um, <laughs> and then I've been here for 17 years, I still can't believe it. Um, I studied at Kofsi, studied law, and then I worked at Patsone Neni for seven and a half years before I joined Vian's company. Um, and then I've been with them for, I think, four years. And that's it. Wow. And um, so the, the tech industry, you know, um, as you said, you studied law. How, how did you decide to go in, into that? Um, and then also as husband and wife. Okay, that part is actually, it's got a simple answer. At some stage, we started spending so much money with people suing us and us suing people that it became cheaper to have an in-house attorney. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's why Zenio, that's why Zenio needed a lawyer, but why she went, um, I think she can explain on a personal level why she came. Yeah, so. <laughs> That's why they decided to hire me. I must say, mostly I try to prevent litigation by making it impossible for the other people to really do anything. Um, <laughs> so for me personally, I was, um, worked at, like I said, I worked at Patsone Nene for seven and a half years. Um, I was doing property law and then some commercial law as well. And then after about, seven, about that time, I was um, doing the same thing over and over and I needed a change. And then luckily at that time, um, well, before that, when I was much younger, I bought shares in Vian's company um, with money that I learned from the bank in a personal loan. And the credit <laughs> I wouldn't, card. I wouldn't suggest that. <laughs> don't, don't try this at home. Anyway, luckily at that time, I was able to sell that. So I had a little bit of time to decide what I wanted, um, sort of what I wanted to do. And then at the same time, they started needing someone. And then I decided, you know, instead of doing my own thing and starting from scratch, I'm going to join a company that's already like doing great things and then be part of that and grow with that. And Good how choice. do you find working together? Yeah, look, all couples have some sort of hobby and ours is to work. So it actually, got, that's a thing we do together. So it kind of works out. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that's it. It just works. Yeah. <laughs> that's not a joke. Yeah, no, it's not, it's not a... <laughs> Okay, uh, look, honestly, we can say things like this, but you live in Bloemfontein, like, what are you going to do? <laughs> you, you, I mean, your options are work or go walk in the botanical garden, and if that's finished, what do you do then? You, you go work. So. Wow, that's one. So I think that brings me to my question, then why Bloemfontein? Because literally it drives you simply just to work on, on, on the business. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's honestly, 
it's a great place to be an entrepreneur um, in some senses. For one is, uh, 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 actually Peter Thiel made this point. You guys know who he is, right? He's basically the guy that funded everything that's anything in the world, from Facebook to PayPal to Palantir to whatever, right? So he spoke about it yesterday, what a waste it is. He said that whenever he writes somebody in Silicon Valley a check, he's now a venture capitalist. Then he knows that 80% of that check ultimately ends up in the pockets of landlords because either it's for a salary for people to pay for a flat. Yeah, really, you, you'd get a flat like um, between these four pillars for four and a half thousand dollars um, in San Francisco. So, uh, yeah, that's why when I visit there, I stay in the hotels where you sort of pay by the hour. <laughs> it's, it's all I can afford, literally. But the, um, So that's one thing. Um, in Bloemfontein, yesterday I saw it's actually the cheapest city in South Africa. So if you're going to be an entrepreneur and you need to make capital stretch, it's just a great place to be. Uh, you know, it just, you can really uh, make, put the money towards a business. The other thing is, um, it's actually true. In Bloom, I do feel I can work a whole, whole lot harder because there's just a lot less distractions and a lot less traffic and things like that. So I don't know what Bia's reasons are. No, that's the same. We spend about 10 minutes a day in traffic at the most. Um, and the rest of the time we can work. So yeah, and it's up. a big plus. If you go to Johannesburg, you waste a day very quickly. Like, two meetings, gone. <laughs> So the, the um, cross into starting the company, was this the first company that you, you founded? Um, what was your journey into entrepreneurship? Uh, yeah, okay, so she, lawyer, loan, is <laughs> it? Uh, yeah, um, no, I started my career at a hedge fund. Uh, we were doing some of the first quant trading in, um, well, actually, not just Africa, probably the world. Um, so I wrote commodity arbitrage algorithms, and then uh, I did something slightly stupid. In, I was there for about nine months, and I thought, well, it's sort of, you guys are borrowing money and trading this algorithm, and then paying me 10% of whatever I make. So I could go do that myself. And uh, it's sort of, okay, in theory, but the uh, business is quite tough. And if I wanted to do myself a solid, I should have just uh, maybe stayed working for somebody from two, three, maybe five more years, just get some more contacts, more capital, um, because I was just always on the verge of extinction. I had to every now and again be extremely brilliant just to survive, so, and that was kind of unnecessary. But yeah, so I started my business doing commodity arbitrage. 2008, uh, my brother is an actuary, uh, the middle brother, not Ronnie. Um, uh, he's an actuary in Dubai, and he was working for a company that did click arbitrage. And uh, basically, if you click on an ad on the internet, then you're not just clicking on an ad. What you don't know is like there's maybe 20 people in a frenzy trading for you, uh, deciding how much they're going to pay for your click, selling it. That same click will, mul um, will exchange hands multiple times. And uh, so I was basically writing some of that algorithms, and that's what Zinio initially did. Back then, our name was Traffic Squared. Uh, in 2013, I went to Attic San Francisco, uh, and back then I could kind of stay about a kilometer away from the pay by the hour section because it was still cheaper. That's a, it's a brand new thing, this. And San Francisco, and there was a lot less homeless people. Yeah. You could still walk on the sidewalk. Yeah. Uh, that's actually a thing. 10,000 people are now living homeless there because they cannot afford the living in tents on the sidewalk. Okay. So enough about San Francisco. In 2013, it was still a nice place. Uh, I met two people. Um, they had a company called Tiger Leads. They were doing almost something like click arbitrage, but they were buying and selling real realtor leads. So it's almost like property 24. You go on the website. You say, oh, I like this house. Connect me to a realtor. Then you, you get, again, people going to bidding frenzy trying to figure out how much you're worth, how likely you are to actually buy the house. Then you get finally sold off to a realtor. And... Uh, yeah, there's an entire market for that. So I was, so I helped them writing algorithms to uh, make a prediction on what somebody's likely worth is as a buyer. Uh, they liked the work we did. So what happened was they started a new company called Walopa, and our company merged into Wal Traffic Squared merged into Walopa at um, three million dollar valuation at that stage, and then um, so here's a part maybe we should talk about a bit later partnerships. So, and, yeah, and how tough it is. And uh, so we had irreconcilable differences about uh, 18, 
it's about less than two years. So me and the engineering team left, and uh, we kept the core architecture, uh, but we founded Xenia. Uh, which is just a name change. In fact, everything, we even kept the green. It was just like off with my lope, on with the Xenia. And we've been at it ever since, so. Right, and um, so you travel quite a bit. Um, yes. Do you find that being in the tech space that has given you, um, you know, better insight and opportunities, um, and would you advise somebody looking to go into tech to do that? Or could somebody that wasn't able to, to get to San Francisco, um, how would they access information if they wanted to, to, you know, go along the lines of tech? Yeah, okay. So, thank you for that question. Um, I, you guys know it's like, it's the greatest irony for me when I see this protest uh, for, free, for free education, right? And I guess it's a debate about definitions uh, because it depends on what you view as education. If education for you is a stamp and a sticker that said, okay, yeah, this guy now passed this degree, then okay, maybe, whatever. But that's not what I view as education, right? Uh, Education is something that you could get for free from a book. Uh, you could get it for free on the internet. And that really, I, I, I'll be honest with you, Xenia would not be founded 10 years ago. Uh, it would be impossible because there's, I, I mean, I did get a sticker from Kofsis, but there's this extreme disparity between what you learn at Stanford and what you learn at uh, um, South African University. And uh, actually, I mean, it's not that I'm picking on South Africa. It's any other university, Stanford is just a uh, cut above, and uh, especially as far as tech goes. But now, every single Stanford course is online. So instead of throwing rocks and burning tires, you could be sitting and actually going through every single Stanford course, getting an education right on par with the best that has ever been in the world. For free. Free, guess what? Free education. And uh, so that's actually my answer to that. So yeah, it's great if you travel because you also need contacts. But it, it's not necessary, though. I mean, we've signed multi-million dollar deals without ever meeting the people in person uh, via Skype. So you could, via something like LinkedIn, via like Facebook, you could get the necessary introductions. It is harder. Uh, and then via something like YouTube or whatever else, Coursera, Udacity, you can get all the education you need at world level, uh, no cost. Well, maybe data, but if that's really a problem, you know, I can give you that 200 rand. That's trivial. That's not. There's, there's one thing that's a bit easier over um, in America. It's that people sort of mingle a lot easier and they're more accessible to do business together. So if we could change one thing in South Africa, mm. that would be to be a bit more open um, in business. For instance, if you attend a conference here, then it would be very odd if you stop someone in the elevator <laughs> and start talking to him. Like, that would be weird. But in the States, like you go to get coffee in the morning before you even have your makeup on and people start pitching you and talking. Um, so it would be great if we can sort of get kind of that kind of culture going here. Yeah. Maybe not that time in the morning, but... <laughs> yeah. 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 Super. So um, would you mind sharing perhaps what uh, some of your lowest moments have been as a company? <laughs> 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 if any. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> There's actually a whole book for this, yeah. <laughs> Any entrepreneur should read this, unless you have a very good business and you never struggle. Uh, it's called, um, what's it called, by Ben, Oro the ben Oro uh, the Hard Things About Hard Things. Yeah, The Hard Thing About Hard Things. Go, yeah. <laughs> I, I read that book about three times a year. <laughs> okay, so uh, in that book he says, uh, this, he talks about the struggle, so that's in business. The struggle is when you wonder why you started the company in the first place. The struggle is when people ask you why you don't quit and you don't know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> the struggle is when food loses its taste. The struggle is when you want the pain to stop, it's unhappiness. It's not failure. The struggle is not failure, but it causes failure, especially if you are weak, always when you are weak. So <laughs> on that point, I've read this book many times. And then... It, we've gone through tough times. I, I mean, I cannot even, I, I could give you like an entire evening's entertainment and lecture on failure. Uh, but I mean, the truth in business is honestly that, uh, look, it just, uh, 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 actually, you know, what I like about Ben Horowitz, he also, he's a bit from the wrong side of the track. So uh, if you read his book, and do read it, but uh, the language, right? But he, he's like, um, <laughs> So, so, okay, yes, yeah, one vintage Ben Horowitz. He's like, um, okay, let me just 
smooth things out for you. Okay, so he by, basically what he says, it comes down to, if somebody says to him, if somebody was successful, and he said, well, congratulations on that, and the person answers him with something like, yeah, yeah, it was this and this strategic decision when he, ju when, okay, he, he, he demerits that, <laughs> that opinion, and uh, he, say, he, he, say, he just doesn't give any credence to that, because he says, the honest answer is, uh, look, Ben, I failed a million times, and just when I thought I couldn't fail anymore, I failed again and again and again, and then, but I never quit, and that's actually the only answer uh, for success in entrepreneurship. It's just if you can somehow one more time get yourself be smashed to pieces and get yourself up and it becomes harder if you've got a team and investors and things like that because uh, I mean even your, your team the first thing you'll see business goes through a tough time the team leaves you you need to you need to be able to rally people you need to be able to first up get yourself together get your team together get your investors together get your customers together it's a tall order but um, it can be done and, and talking about team, um, how did you go about building a team in Bloemfontein? Um, you know, it would <laughs> have, have they been a support? You know, yes, we see people come and go, but would you say that your team has been a support to you um, in, in building your company? Yeah, uh, B, do you want to? You no. look like you want to take this. No, no, you, the you first two guys are your guys, so you can take it. Yeah, so. Uh, okay, so there you go, right? now. So I cannot give you, in fact, I did write down an entire strategy section here on team, uh, which I, I will go through to because I want to see if I can bring something of value to you guys. But uh, that being said, the honest answer is actually luck uh, and not giving up because by pure coincidence, uh, the first two guys that came to work for me were, was first up absolutely brilliant and uh, they, they, um, they grew up with me on the wrong side of the tracks and they actually are intensely loyal, right? And if it wasn't for those two guys, then uh, there's no Xenio. It's There's a lot of people with without him, there's no Xenio, but those two guys are like right at the um, bottom of the pyramid. So after I point those two guys, I decide, well, I'm so good, I'm brilliant. I've got really a knack for pointing people. I just look at you and I can sum you up and yeah, you, you, you. It turns out I was just lucky. Because after that, right, I have honestly appointed some of the biggest damn rejects you can ever find. And, and then I was stupid enough not to fire them for months and months and months until they basically destroyed the business. And so, so that's how dumb I actually am. But I, I was lucky enough. And uh, along the way, along the way, along the way, I did pick up a uh, couple of more very smart guys and I think I've learned a couple of things about good people which I'll try to bring over to you but one of them is actually sitting there, uh, Ruben. Yeah, uh, I'll, and we'll talk about that a little bit later but yeah, unfortunately mostly luck. <laughs> so. Well, it, it would be great if you go, could go into your strategy. Okay, so this is about... Um, Moshe, I have to give you a compliment, right? You know that Calvin Coolidge said, uh, if you want me to give a 30 minute speech, I need uh, 10 minutes preparing. If you want a 10 minute speech a day and a five minute speech a week, right? Your speech was right on board, bro. You need, that, there was a lot of pre preparation into that. It took me three months. Yeah, there you go. To get, to get those points compressed like that. And so I'm, but I'm gonna try my best to get this brief for you. Okay, so business, right, strategy. Um, BR is gonna, talk a bit about these two components to entrepreneur and to business. Strategy and self-management. And they're actually equally important. Um, and we going to talk about self-management. So just about strategy, right? So there's a fundamental question you need to answer before we start talking about business, right? And that is actually, uh, why are you here? Now, I don't expect you to be able to answer that tonight. And to be honest, that's the goal of philosophy and religion. It's some explanation of why you're here, right? But um, it, it does get a little bit easier just one level up. So after you've answered, the, after you've given the whatever the right answer, like maybe if you come from Judeo-Christian, then you can say, well, life is sort of a test to see if I can ascend into heaven. Uh, so, okay, that's fine. Uh, then there's, but then there's after that the more practical question that said, okay, well, then whilst I'm being tested, what am I then actually going to do tomorrow? And that's the why I want to focus on. It's like that thing. Why do I keep myself busy with day to day? 
uh, how do I give meaning to my life, right? And you need to answer that first. And I'll tell you why. Uh, I had somebody quit. Entrepreneurship is incredibly tough, right? And you need to figure out why it is that you actually want to do that. Because I had somebody quit in the beginning of the year. And his problem with me was basically he works too hard and he wants to spend time with his family and that I made him work on a public holiday, right? And so, okay, okay, okay and fair enough, he wants to spend time with his family, so that's his why in his life, right? So he decided that's the most important thing, not a problem. But then there's a thing where I feel so sorry for the sad bastard. His answer to that is that he's walking away from us, he's starting a business, right? And I'm like, Okay, so your problem is you don't want to work on public holidays. Your answer to that is you're going to start your own business. <laughs> Good luck, because the, 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 reason, the, the reason we were working was because Amazon phoned me and said we had three days to sort our shit out and they shut us down. So it was honestly not for me. Um, you know, so we were on our way to Gold Tiff City and it was just like, okay, be our cancel, send me, cancel everything, whatever we can get back. Uh, it looks like we are... Uh, sitting in the office over Passover, you know, so it was no f not fun for him, no fun for me, but that's the type of things that happens all the time if you're an entrepreneur. Um, so make sure, I, I, I'm, okay, now I, I don't sound, say this to be facetious or funny, it's really, it's, I think that's actually, if you take anything away from this tonight, then start there, like, why are you doing this? If you don't actually have a good answer, um, you know, I, I almost want to see, say, even if you want to be rich, then maybe entrepreneurship is also not the best way to go because you're always six months, however rich you become, you're always six months away from ruin because your overreach just always expand with the business. That's one problem. The other thing is, um, uh, it, it's just that entrepreneurship, it, it's got this extreme exponential distribution, right? And the same as pro, it's like saying I'm going to be a pro golfer because I want to be rich or <laughs> A Hollywood film star because I'm rich, right? For every one person you see that's extremely rich, uh, there's a million failures. And for even that one person, it might not be even worth for him because he's failed himself a million times. So just make, make sure that's not your answer. Because if you want to be rich, I think there's other ways. Uh, like maybe become an engineer at this stage or something. Okay. So you need to find out what's your personal reason. Masha, yeah. Yeah. Can I come out of this one? Yeah. It's super important because, like, to give you my story, I sold my company to PwC, PricewaterhouseCoopers is by far a worse company than Mazars, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> and, and then what I did is I quit as a partner at PwC. I was the only person in the history of the company to quit as a partner. And at the age of 36, why did I do it? just simply to work hand in hand with people like sitting here. Because I think like life's too short. And if you want to get rich, just go to companies like, you know, those big corporations. That's, that's more safe, more easy, and you know what to expect. Whereas here, you never know what's gonna happen. But I believe me, it's gonna be so much fun. <laughs> yeah, thanks much, Shai. Yeah, and if you, if, you wanna have, if you wanna be rich, it's right, go work for a big company. If you want to um, mow the lawn at four, then go work for a municipality. It's like a, a government, civic service. No, I, I'm actually, I'm serious, right? That's, okay. So that's the first thing, and I'll try. So I told you guys, you need to prepare long like my shade to be succinct in your speech, so I'm gonna do better now. Um, the second thing you need to understand about a business, right? There's one good answer actually for why a business. Why not, uh, why not, uh, for instance, work by yourself, why not work in a big corporation? So this is a rhetorical question, so don't answer, but who is happy with uh, government, uh, with your government you live under, right? Uh, so just think about it. <laughs> and, the, uh, and I'll tell you why, it will be for almost everybody, no. And the reason is, uh, and this is, <laughs> this is what my shade tries businesses to get businesses to, services are bundled. Uh, you cannot, when you go to pick and pay, you're in general happy with your trolley of goods because you've picked like this one, not that one, this one. With government, you can really vote, uh, like basically, let's say in America, you can vote Republican or Democrat, and with them comes an entire bundle. You cannot pick and choose what you like, right? So essentially, you live in an ecosystem you've got no influence over. So that's the problem. You cannot, in, you've got zero, it's a lie, you've got zero influence over government. None. Absolutely zero. Uh, so, but if, and you cannot solve problems using government, 
Okay. Uh, the, f um, what you also, if you're a single person, the scope of problems you can solve is extremely limited because I mean, I can maybe do an endeavor like, I mean, if I was one person, then maybe I can mow a lawn tomorrow or I can uh, paint a house over a week, but that's the pinnacle of the achievement I can make. Maybe I can write a book over here. There's no way you can achieve what Zenio has achieved as one person. You need to be a well-connected team. So a startup is the biggest entity that you will ever in your life be have, have control over. So if there's a big problem you want to solve, the only way to actually get it done is to start the company. That's the only way. You, can, you will not be able to do it for government, and if the problem is big enough, you'll not be able to do it yourself, but you can control the entity, uh, and that's actually so... The only good answer, I think, for why you want to be in a company is there's free, and that goes to strategy. You need to be able to say one thing, um, in, answer one question, and that's one sentence. You need to be able to say, I'm going to do some irreplaceable work um, on a unique problem. So it's a unique problem that I'm working on, my work. If my contribution is not there, then it's not going to get contributed to. And uh, I'm going to do it with like-minded people. That's the answer for why you run a business. And uh, I just want to say, please don't take things I say, these are supposed to be things you should think about, don't take it as black and white, uh, the, because it's also true, I mean, now it's not, you don't necessarily go have to go and cure cancer, it's also a problem that this dean doesn't have a proper coffee shop, so <laughs> working on coffee is a unique problem, uh, nobody else is doing it, so it's irreplaceable, and you can't do it with like-minded people, so, okay. Um, the second part, so that's that one sentence. And whenever somebody asks you, you're supposed to be, su you're supposed to be able to answer those three things, one sentence, so people understand it. Okay? Then um, the second part is uh, product and capital. And I think that's actually what, why most of you are here. So, okay, I need to raise $2 million. So there's, uh, I didn't know this was going to be projected. Oh, so I could make you some slides. But this, you have to think about business on two axes, right? The one is the X axis and the other one is for, uh, and Y axis. So on your X axis, you've got your risk. Um, it's how much you're going to invest in this, what's it going to cost you, right, to do this business. On the Y axis, you've got your level of innovation. So I I in this bottom right quadrant where you've got high risk low and low innovation, now, I, I promise you, there will not be a single person who will put his hand up and say, I'm there. But truth be told, it's where most companies are most of the time. That's the reason 90% of companies fail in the first year. Okay. So how do you know you're low innovation? When I ask you what you do, and I prod you a little bit, and you say to me, it's just like blah, 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 but blah, 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 right? So <laughs> it's just like... Um, it's just like spur, but we focus we focus specifically on hamburgers. Then that's not innova that's not innovation. It's like the f um, it's but being the fifth nightclub in Second Avenue. It's being the uh, whatever, right? So there's just a couple of businesses that are not innovative. Um, okay. Now, on the other qu and we'll talk about what you do there in a minute. On the other side, there's low risk, but also low innovation. So mostly there is where you'll find a lot of small businesses that stay around for ages, like a florist, uh, maybe. In fact, most professional firms, like a law firm, maybe you can start a web design company. It's low risk. I mean, what do you need? You need a couple of flyers and a website and sit in your garage. But it's also, what's the innovation? It's, it's low, right? Okay. So then going up to, no, let me go, let's go up this way first, right? So high innovation, low risk. Uh, so, okay, that's the, dream of every, that's the dream of everybody. And if you ever watch Silicon Valley, you'll see the VCs are always chasing after something like, Richard said something about VR. So about two years ago, that was VR. Then it was just like, if you have VR, then everybody just throws money to you. Boom, boom, boom. Nobody knows what it is, but I want it, right? So a, a year ago, a few months ago, you saw that frenzy of um, tokens, crypto tokens. Nobody knows what it is, but everybody wants it, right? So... Well, that's really, when you get that type of thing, it's usually when there's a new industry, there's, um, you can be, the, you've got opportunity to be the first mover in something. Uh, sometimes that gets, it usually gets created by new technology. Uh, it sometimes gets created by, it sometimes gets created by government intervention. Uh, as a concrete example, um, there was a massive wealth transfer in South Africa under B. Um, there's some companies that, 
they so uh, if you ask them what their vision is uh then it would solely be something like it would come down to a black economic empowerment right and kudos to them it created some sort of disrupt this low risk disruption and that's why Cyril Ramaphosa became a billionaire in a year or whatever right so it's this massive disruption okay uh, I would caution against working with government on things like that because uh, the hand that can give is the hand that can take. Uh, so it's not necessarily defensible. So next year your crowd gets voted out. Um, and so what do you do then, right? But, okay, uh, that's, on that, that's on that side. So if you get such an, let's talk quickly about if you get that opportunity, uh, what do you do? So the one thing is, Assuming you're not working with government, um, I mean, there's people that can advise you on that, but I'm not one of them. Uh, but assuming you're working in some sort of tech space, there's some disruption that happens, something that wasn't possible yesterday that's now possible. You need to move extremely quick because um, a, a lot of these things have network effects. You cannot start another Facebook today. Facebook just became possible at that stage because finally computers became fast enough to handle all of that data and things like that. But you cannot start a Facebook today because, okay, who's gonna come there? Because people are on Facebook, everybody's there because everybody's there. That's what a network effect is. Now, what you will need to achieve is if you ever can do something like this, is you'll need to move very, very quickly. Uh, and you, so in the end, there can be only one. That's actually, it's like the, are you guys old enough for Highlander? <laughs> do you remember the quickening? Okay, in the end, okay, whatever. <laughs> but it's like there can be only one, right? And um, so then you have to move very fast. Uh, on the other side, now this is the side which I think everybody wants to talk about tonight. So it's high risk, um, but high innovation. Now, um, what happens there is, look, <laughs> there's a lot of things that are possible to build, like our algorithm is theoretically possible. Uh, it's not easy to build it. It costs a lot of money. So now it's got a high risk to it. Um, how do you get around for risk? Well, investment. Uh, instead of me putting up $2 million, which obviously I don't have, but you now you get 20 guys putting up $100,000. So that's where investment comes from. Now, if you want to get funded, then you'll need to explain to, uh, that's what a VC does. You need to explain to him why your idea is innovative, why it's worthy. You need to explain to him, look, this thing is innovative. This is, okay, don't use Facebook because then it's not innovative, but this is, don't say the next Facebook, you need to explain to him like, uh, this is gonna be such and such and so cool, you can do this, something you can never done. Remember those three things I told you, irreplaceable, unique, and um, like-minded people. You need to say that to VC and say to him, VC is venture capitalist, sorry. If you, uh, so you need to be able to say that to him and say, look, the only problem is, uh, I don't have $2 million, or I don't wanna risk my entire $2 million. That's how you get funded. You need to have, make, do good, you, you need to have, um, you need to be able to explain that, right? Now let's just quickly talk about these lower two. Oh, I, I want to give you some ideas here, just so you, you know. Um, uh, have you noticed? And um, who's the guy that does the domestic workers for? Yeah, that's actually an example. I mean, if I have to say you're just like what? What am I going to say? It's <laughs> it doesn't exist. Okay, so uh, that's actually that's that's pretty much a good example. That's actually a pretty good example. Uh, but to really do it, there's network effects there. So, and maybe you can start small, but you, know, you probably, uh, and the other problem is if you start it in Bloemfontein, then uh, some other bastard's gonna get funded and do it in Johannesburg and Cape Town, and then <laughs> you just get gobbled up like that. But, so that's a good case of why it's unique, it's innovative, but you actually need funding. Uh, you'll need to move quick, right? Uh, it's gonna have a very high, um, it's gonna have very high investment in it. Uh, so, the, another thing I want to tell, talk to you guys quickly is the word globalization. Essentially, that means copy and paste. It's like copy here and paste here. So, think about this, right? Um, in, on this topic, Bloemfontein doesn't have an Uber. Uh, so, what's the risk, really? You know that it works. You know exactly how the interface needs to look. Uh, but it's not here. So, what's really the risk of, in general, businesses like that? Okay. And I'll, I'll tell you this, there's companies that, entire companies, like what is take a lot other else than a ripoff of Amazon, uh, or better buy than eBay, or, and it happens across the world, uh, especially when you have language, it works best when you have language barriers, because um, 
Amazon can go to English countries, but where they were not successful is like Poland, where uh, uh, there's a language barrier. It's like they've got Allegro, or um, they've got in uh, Japan rak Rakuten. So often you can use language as a copy and paste. So it's basically, then, it, then this line works a little bit. If you say it's just like that, but. If your but is, it's just like Facebook, but it's for people that only speak Sutu. Then you've got a, you've actually got a, that's a pretty good answer to that because it turns out that language is pretty sticky. So Africa is probably not the greatest example of that because we do mostly use English. But in Poland, that's not the case. Uh, in Japan, that's not the case. In Germany, that's not the case. So people have become billionaires simply ripping off, going to America, looking at what they doing it there. What you do have in South Africa is geography based though. Um, Amazon cannot ship here. It's too far from the distribution center. So that's why take a lot works. There's a lot of business in Silicon Valley like that. So, and I can talk to you guys a little bit about some ideas, things that could be built here that isn't done currently. Um, so, that's, and then, so that's a strategy. Uh, I've got some books here that I'll recommend for you, but maybe I'll just, uh, we can put it, oh, I wanna say one more thing about this brutal, this brutal zone, right, the low innovation. So you know how you win there. It's by being brutal. Um, it's if you are going to be in a business that there's no innovation, there's nothing unique to it, then the only thing you can do is you can compete on price or service. So how do you compete on price? Well, uh, there's a reason like uh, garment shops are called sweatshops. It's not that the owner of that factory is so evil and the Google owners are so great, that's why they give massages and slides and dinners and... <laughs> factory, garment factory doesn't have aircon, it's because um, each shirt is a unique, is a um, perfect substitution for another one. If I don't wear a gay shirt, I can wear a Levi shirt or a million other brands, or I can have a million, but 30 other brands, right? So the only way they can compete is on price. So what do they do? Well, you can pay the absolute minimum in the factory. People have to work maximum hours. The temperature needs to be set at minimum, the lighting needs to be set at minimum. That's the only way, and even then, you know, you guys know those companies that rule don't make money. They, in general, they've got extremely low returns on equity. So that's how, but that's how you survive there. You, be, you, you have to be brutal. The other thing you can do with those, and it can work in hospitality, it's not exactly a sweatshop thing, but good service. So, um, and, but that, it's a bit tricky. It's not as trivial as it sounds. You would think that you can just have a restaurant and give people the best service, right? Like bring their food on time, greet friendly, be helpful. Uh, yeah, it turns out that personnel doesn't necessarily think like that. So the way you will have your shop running like that is that you probably have to say at the end of each week, okay, you guys were the 10 worst waiters, cheers. Uh, I'm getting some better people in. So it's basically being brutal. Uh, that's the way you can. And I mean, for some, some people just love that. So, but you need to decide where you want to pitch here. Uh, that is the way that can work. Uh, and I, I think just as one example, quickly, uh, Avanti is probably the best restaurant for me in West Dean, right? And they give extremely good service, extremely good food. And they run a tight ship. So when New York got built, I think they went through a very bad spot. I almost thought there was no customers. <laughs> but I had the suspicion people would be back because the one thing that's interesting about them, and that's why they can survive in such a brutal environment so long, the service is great, the food's great, the service is great. You can walk in there and you know exactly what you're gonna get. So if you can sort of get that level, then I think you can make it. Okay, so that's on strategy. Uh, then the other things are very quick. So the only thing I wanna mention to you is on team. So we just mentioned that, okay, so you've got your product and your cap, you've got your product and your capital and it usually goes on and on. Uh, team. So, <laughs> I can give you, like I told you, mostly it's going to end up being luck. So you need to appoint, the, many, are, many are called, few are chosen, right? So you need to appoint a lot of people and get rid of a bad one. So it's the only way. <laughs> um, some help I can give you is, um, if you're in an interview, you need to screen for entitlement. Somebody that's got an entitlement problem is, in 100% of instances, a bad worker. So it's basically somebody that feels that life owes him something purely by virtue of him or her being him or her. Like, I don't know why. I deserve to be happy at my job. I deserve people treating me with respect. Look, <laughs> it, it's nice, and you want to treat people with respect because you want, that's the type of society you want to create, but 
you're definitely not entitled to it. I mean, I can prove it to you. If one of you end up saying something rude to me now, what can I do? I just have to accept it. But if I've got an entitlement problem, now I get all wound up on it, uh, you, you know, and it, it just, you're never going to be treated in a business exactly the way you want to be treated. It's not because a business is, has to be carved to many stakeholders. You have to give a return to investors. You have to satisfy your customers. You have to satisfy all the employees. It doesn't exist to satisfy the needs and wants of one individual. But if a person is entitled, that is what he or she believes. It never works out. So watch out for that. If, you, if there's one type of employee you don't want, it's somebody with an entitlement problem. Um, then the other thing we do at Zinio is culture fit. So somebody can maybe not be entitled, but it's just uncomfortable, or she's uncomfortable with the uh, culture, right? So we've got a, uh, I found in Zinio what works the best is general people that grew up a bit tough. Um, so they first up are a lot less likely to be entitled. Uh, so uh, Ruben, can I say you grew up without a dad? Yeah. Is it okay? Yeah, well, uh, uh, Luke, uh, yeah, I, I don't think it, I don't think it cared, but, yeah, I mean, uh, there wasn't a lot of extras there, right? Yeah. yeah. And um, so it's people like that in general make good employees. But it's also another thing, like in Xenia, we just have a sort of uh, audaciousness and a bit of, uh, I don't know, a bit brash. So just like we're going to, look, I'm going to die someday. Things are going to go bad, but I'm going to give everybody hell until that day right so that's and those people work well but not everybody so watch out for that and every business culture will be unique you need to figure out what's your culture and make sure the person fits and then the last thing is technical screening i also want to talk to you guys quickly about marketing okay so uh, marketing uh, once you've got a product right and you figured out okay these are my customers and I'm funded, so it's now built. Okay, so now it needs to, it sort of needs to get into the world, right? And I would actually say that m majority of businesses doesn't fail on e any of the previous things. It actually fails on marketing. It's not being able to move this box um, from you to the, into the world. And um, you need to watch out for something. Uh, these, and again, don't take what I say is black and white. Okay, sorry. Oh, yeah. So there's a, um, you need to figure out what your lifetime customer value is. Uh, it's in some business is difficult, but it's extremely important. If there's, Moshe, if there's one thing he's gonna, somebody's gonna know is that, right? Yeah. So if you don't know that, honestly, you don't know shit. Then you might as well, you're guessing. You need that one figure. It's difficult for a coffee shop. Um, you need to know that because, I mean, if you don't know in this person's lifetime if he's going to spend one dollar or ten dollars or a hundred or a thousand right then how do you know how much you can spend on getting that customer into your door so if you cannot answer that one question you cannot run your business when you're guessing you're taking it you're throwing a dice so you need to know what the lifetime customer value is uh, and you need to find uh, uh, there's ways even there's ways you can find it out even in more tricky businesses okay uh, now, after you know that, you need to go and take a look at how you market. So, there's a tricky zone for uh, some businesses, um, like Facebook, makes about a dollar to six dollars per customer um, over the course of his life. Like News24 probably earns about, a, it's going to earn a dollar out of each of you over the lifetime. It's not a lot. So, News24 cannot spend a single cent on acquiring you. It has to be via, so that sort of market, and so with Facebook, they cannot pay to get you. It's too low. I mean, what are you, which cup of customer are you going to buy for $6? But w what they've got going for them is virality. So in Facebook, um, you're there because everybody's there. Remember, somebody invited you someday, and you invited other people, and that's how, so they got their customers for free. So in the $1 to $6 zone, $1 to $10 zone, you can <coughs> go viral. That's what you have to hope for. In the 10 to 100 dollar zone, um, uh, you basically can do marketing. So those are things such as, uh, uh, I mean, probably most, if you have some shampoo, you've got a water bottle, you've got whatever, right? It's probably in that range, and you do that through marketing, like Procter & Gamble, uh, that type of thing. So if that's your product, you can, it's tricky, but you can get it done, um, and then, there's another part I'm just going to skip. So 10000 to a $1 million. That's personal sales. Uh, so you will have some salesman going out selling, right? Uh, and I, don't, I, I wanted to go into how we do that, but 
uh, let's, uh, I don't think we have time, so maybe another time. But when I want to warn you against something, between where, the $100 to the thousand, $10,000 zone, lifetime customer value, is a problem. It's called the dead zone. Um, it, it, the problem is nobody's going to spend $5,000 based on a television ad. It's extremely, it's c extremely rare. Somebody's going to look at the newspaper and then, okay, yeah, let's go spend uh, 50000 rand. I mean, no, yeah, it's very rare. But at the same time, um, it's not enough money that you can actually uh, pay a salesperson to go and sell that. That's it. So that's a dead zone. Um, and if you have a, so there's ways to get around it. And actually, Buffetown has two very good entrepreneurs, um, two brothers, Kevin and Ian Hell, and they m built a huge business selling uh, in that zone. And I, if you want, I can get Ian at some stage. I think you'll enjoy him. But, uh, so there's, there's, there are there are um, uh, there are people that get it done sometimes, but in general, if you can pick and make your life easier, just get out of the hundred to ten thousand dollars zone. It's a dead zone for a reason. So for every one person that makes it, there's probably a thousand that fails there. Uh, and then, yeah. So look, if you want to have questions, then we can talk about um, how do you know your idea is actually innovative, and uh, how do you raise capital, but uh, I've said a lot now, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely wonderful. I mean, there's just so much knowledge that you've, you've got to share. I think we've got to host you a couple of extra times <laughs> throughout the year. Um, I think just for time's sake, we, we're going to skip straight to Q&A, yeah. um, just so that we've got some time for the audience to come and chat to you personally. <laughs> um, has anybody got any questions? Um, I wanted to ask, uh, what do you think about the the creative space in terms of uh, Africa compared to Silicon Valley. So I want to know, for example, um, incubators maybe in Namibia, you find that the businesses are not so innovative. So you find that um, businesses are, are simply using incubator spaces as um, tenants or rental spaces instead of businesses that could actually be there for, for maybe IT purposes. What do you think about that in, in, in an African space? Um, one thing that I, I can... I a lot, so... <laughs> one thing that I can say about that is um, I definitely think African um, sort of incubator type things will have a bit of an issue um, because we've also found um, traveling um, when you are surrounded by people that are being innovative and that have that sort of energy, then you automatically become more like that. And I think if you are in a place, I grew up in Namibia, <laughs> in Khubavis, there isn't so much innovation there, um, then it will be very difficult to sort of come up with these brilliant and creative ideas if you're not surrounded um, by more people like that. I do think there's ways in which you can bridge that. Um, for instance, on uh, Udemy and places like that, there's actually courses on um, innovation and creativity that are very good. So I think it could be bridged even within small small places in Africa. Okay, I was just wondering um, with what you said with uh, the expected amount that a customer would spend. Yeah. Yeah, and the um, in the long term, so over their lifetime. Um, could you perhaps give a, just a simple example of something like that? I can imagine that it would be fairly complex. Um. Uh, yeah, actually, you know, um, Masha, you want to handle Lifetime, uh, because this now actually, I mean, uh, you've got a professor, Justin, with one topic, so. <laughs> yeah, so, like, this is an example of how we use, like, the uh, sophisticated analytics. Like, when I work for, an, for a bank, you know, like, what I would do is I would be able to give each and every of you a personal scoring all on a life cycle value, and I would know, for instance, how much discount I should give you to get you on board. So I would like to know that for you, I can invest giving you a free like credit card, but like for you, it just wouldn't pay off. Either you take the one and you pay $100 a year, or you just get lost. So, well, but the only reason would be that I would know that in the lifetime, you just bring more money to my bank than you would. And it works the same with any other business. Like, um, I think, you know, when online retailing is a great example. 
Like, I don't know if you know that a lot of retailers, they would just differentiate their prices based on certain, you know, customer criteria. Why? Simply because I would know that your uh, price elasticity is different than the one of some other person. So really, like, it just shows why the things that the guys do has a future. Like, it's all based on data. It's not just, you no, know, I'm like a professor, and I would say, okay, I should charge you this, and I should charge you that. I need those kind of guys to just give me guidance and to support those decisions. Um, thanks, Moshe. Yeah, so uh, concretely, uh, just uh, look, it sometimes, and that's actually more or less what we do. So we estimate, like, I um, remember real, real estate leads, so I wanted to know how likely is this person to buy. Uh, so we, we, we wrote an entire algorithm just for that. So it can be complicated, but it can also be easy uh, in just if you just want to use like a Buddha method in your business. Then what you could do is you can just say, look, um, I, maybe you've got, that's why you've got something like a customer loyalty card. And you simply start giving it out and you say, look, uh, I'll give you a free coffee every 10 for whatever. And by, by doing that, it's a, only a small percentage of people that's going to actually do that. But you get an idea of how much does we, how often do they come in, um, of how much do they spend. So you'll need to um, use some basic statistics there. I mean, it depends now. If you really want it at the high level, like at the bank level, then you either need to get mache or, you know, you get some algorithm like we do. But so it can be complicated, it can be easy, but you need to, you, you do need to know that. You need some estimation of it. You need to uh, make your best case when if you cannot. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if your business is small enough, it's not like, look, let's say you've got a gardening service. Uh, who, is the guy, uh, sorry, what's your name? The guy with the um, a domestic worker? The Bono. Do you know how much your customer, you, you're small enough that you know some of your customers by name, right? Yeah, so you can go and work out in the last month how much each of your customers actually spend. So you know what your lifetime customer value is. So let's say it's 100 rand or 500 rand. He knows he can spend on each customer up to 500 rand uh, for get acquiring them. Uh, yeah. And if you're American, you have to prove how fast you can lose money. So then you say, look, for lifetime customer value is 500, so I'm going to spend 700 <laughs> just to make sure nobody else gets into the market. Uh, that's just a joke. Don't do that. <laughs> Okay, so um, yeah, that's was that good enough? Yeah, but it's entire you need to go. You'll need to go get a book or something. I mean, it's entire discipline. It's not. Oh yeah, I I just wanted to know how how could we breed um, creative ideas or creativity in its own in order to benefit African spaces or Africa as a continent? Because some of the times um, and in educational spaces you find you find a lot of um, dispute resolution measures being European or foreign concepts to solve African problems. And it, 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 it often fails. Uh, you cannot in a zoo give food that belongs to a lion and give it to a snake, uh, or food that belongs to a bird and give it to a shark. You, how do we create African solutions for African problems? Uh, I don't know if my, my question is clear enough. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'll, I'll take a shot. <laughs> so. Um, I think the first step would, would be to um, describe the problem like in real terms, not you know, in African terms, because if you want the solution to fit the problem, then you have to define it completely um, within the context that it exists. And then from doing that, then I think you would, um, at each of the sort of the specific pain points within that problem, go and look within, uh, within the sort of technology that exists um, in that space or in that country or in that um, area, um, what you can apply to that, uh, to that problem. And then only once those are exhausted, look outside for uh, foreign sort of technologies to bring that in to augment the solutions that exist within that space already. I think that could be a way. You know, if I could just add a single thing there, um, which I think will serve you well as a businessman. Um, and that is, look, I know things are, it's popular showing certain things and phrasing it in a certain way and uh, everybody has to be more progressive than the other one. To be dead honest, right, in business you do a whole lot better, more to the middle. Because for every, uh, yeah, it's just the way it is. 
if you travel across the world, when you can find something interesting, when you go to the Middle East, you go to Japan, you go to Poland, and you go to America, then yes, people do have superficial differences. But honestly, um, African, European, Japanese, Polish, at the end of the day, people are 90% similar. They, and that, and in the sense that, in general, the average person, and I'm not talking about people in fringes, in general, people got the following. They wanna wake up in the morning. They wanna have a job that they more or less look forward to. They wanna be able with that job to bring food back home to their families. And they wanna be able to spend an hour or two or three of their family before they go to sleep. That's the general person. And I'll be honest with you, it doesn't differ that much between uh, European or African or any, that's just through across the world. And if you understand that, that that's people, people are just people, and in the middle, that's how it looks. Now look at the fringes when people have to do as much as possible to um, emphasize the differences between uh, like European and African and a male and female and a straight and a gay and whatnot. In the middle, it, that's on a fringe. And for a business, I mean, okay, fine, if you want to target them, but uh, you want to do business in the middle, and there people look pretty much the same, and it's actually a good thing. And in the middle, it's actually also possible to coexist quite a bit more peacefully than you'd ordinarily expect. So that would be my suggestion, thinking about your... Yeah. Um, on innovation, um, don't you think innovation should be broader than just, you know, developing something totally new? but also include um, developing or delivering the product in a better form. If you look at Uber, that it sort of boils down to the business model as well. Uber is not giving a different end product from meter cabs. It's still yes. a similar product, but it boils down to the business model, how they've basically brought down the cost and how they've made it convenient yeah. for the end users. So shouldn't the definition of innovation be broader than just coming up with something new? Yeah, it's good that you ask a question because I had a little slide about that. What's your name? Oh, oh Sony for short. Uh, Son Sony. Sony. Sony, okay, cool. So, yeah, um, actually, it's, <coughs> it's interesting what you mentioned. Uh, so, look, everybody defines things. It, it's really, it, I have to caution, it also comes down to debate on definitions, like what is the innovation? But innovation, the way I would define it, right, is that... Um, you, you need three things at least. The one is if you are going to be technologically better or bring something new into the world, it needs to be 10 times better. Uh, so a good point about Uber. What's the, uh, which Uber is competitor? If I'm standing at Oliver Tambo. No, uh, no uh, uh, bef uh, before Taxify is just like Uber except blah, blah, blah. So we're not talking about that. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it, it's a, a meter taxi. I mean, uh, so, okay, now starting at Oliver Tambo, where we've got, where we've got competition, okay? So, let's say you were three blocks away from Oliver Tambo at, uh, um, you know, at whatever, at the, having a meeting with somebody at the warehouse. Who's the competition for Uber then? So, Uber answers the first question, 10x. In a lot of situations, now I'm not talking about Uber today, I'm talking about Uber when they um, existed, when they started up uh, in 2009. Uber, 10, Uber, 10, Uber brought a solution that's 10x. Um, it, it's, not, it's not that it's completely new rocket science. The cell phone that exists, the concept of phoning a taxi that exists, uh, a taxi that exists, but all of a sudden you can press a button, boom, and now you've got somebody picking up. So there you go, 10x, right? Uh, so that's the one thing. The second thing is right time. Uber couldn't have existed, uh, Uber couldn't have existed 10 years prior. Um, maybe it's theoretically possible to have built some sort of SMS system and proof your routing, mechanical turf type of thing, but it, it, it needs to be at the perfect time. And you see that throughout history, ideas are usually not born in silo. Usually when somebody comes up with something, it was a race to be finished by two or three people. And it, whether you talk about the earth being round or you talk about uh, calculus or you talk about even Uber, every time, or social network or search engines, it's every time it's three people. Um, okay, and now we get to the second part, right? Uh, Uber, and I'm glad you mentioned Uber. Um, Uber answered this third question on innovation. Look, you can build something innovative. You need to get it out in the world. And 
the problem is with Uber is you cannot all of a sudden get the entire world to start using Uber. And if everybody is not using Uber, you've got a problem. It needs sort of a, a things. It, you, you have a need a network effect. So let's say you're the first customer in Uber, right? Okay, great. But if you're the first customer, who's going to be the cars? Because if there's no cars, and if there's only one customer to serve, it's not going to be cars either. If there's no cars, it's not going to be customers. So you've got that sort of chicken and egg um, network effect. The more people there are, the more cars there are. The more cars there are, the easier it is to fetch a ride, the more people there is. Okay, so that brings the third question of innovation. So remember, it was 10x, it was time, and now. Um, you need to be able to start, you cannot start the whole world as your customer. You need to be able to dominate a specific small slice. And what Uber did, do you, does anybody know what Uber did, how they did it? <laughs> okay, they started as a, they started as a, um, so what you did get at that stage was limousine services, where people were used to phoning and getting this type of concierge service. So that was, Uber Black was actually initially Uber. Okay, but even that didn't work. So you want to take a guess at what they did to get the necessary, okay, they started the service. Uh, so, okay, here's some f uh, insane thing in America. People take their dogs to work. So, uh, yes, in the office, there'd be like this 20 dogs, okay? So, what they started doing was, when people have, sh break, when a couple, oh, and couples, they don't have kids, they've got dogs. So, when pe a couple breaks up and they've got shared custody of a dog, then what they would do is, they'd go pick up for one dog in the morning and take him the afternoon <laughs> to, uh, yeah, so you just, uh, yeah, you just ping Uber Black and they'd come fetch your dog and, okay. So, yes, and uh, or they would go in the afternoon and pick your dog up for you, bring it to you and, well, okay, whatever. But, so they picked the, what they did, they shrank, they, so it was technically possible, it was great, but it didn't have a network. So what they did, they, they shrink the market up until that they could dominate 100% of the dog, uh, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> of a, yeah, of a dog concierge service in Los Angeles. <coughs> That's what they did. And from there, I just said, oh yeah, by the way, here's a dog, and uh, you know, if you ever need a ride, then uh, boom, you just, uh, yeah, should, should we pick you up today with your dog and take you back up? Huh? So that's how Uber did it. And every business that is going to innovate must answer that three questions. Otherwise, you don't have innovation. Uh, so, yeah. Awesome. Pia, Vian, thank you so much for your time.